Right, there we go. So welcome back, everybody, to another podcast of Diary of an SEO. We're joined by Stephen Schneider today. Um, you've got, of course, myself, Josh Peacock, and we've got Darius coming on as a co-host today. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, Stephen, so tell us, whereabouts are you based at the minute? Um, I am just north of Seattle, so I'm over on the west coast of the U.S. Um, yeah, it's a little rainy over here, but tis the season. Yeah, well, we're both in Ireland today. It's been raining all day, grey skies, so yeah, I, I feel like you kind of have better weather than us anyway. But um, are you heading to Brighton SEO in the U.S. in San Diego? No, no, I wish I was, but uh, I'll have to catch it next time. Yeah, we're heading over to that. I think it's on the 9th and 10th of November, but myself, Darius, and then Craig, um, we're going to go over to that, which hopefully should be good fun. I know it's their first event in the US. But, um, but yeah, um, Stephen, do you want to give us a little intro to what you do? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Trio SEO. We focus on article writing services uh, to kind of help scale organic traffic and just build brand authority. Most of the you know people that are looking for SEO services focus on technical SEO, backlinks, of course, all those hot topics. But we really believe that having a strong, you know, well-built blog is kind of one of the driving forces to really solidify your site and just kind of open up the doors to really invite new customers. Cool. Uh, how long have you been in SEO, Stephen? I've been in SEO since 2017, I think. Uh, I first got in uh, right around like my kind of last six months of college and started building affiliate niche websites. So like product review, Amazon sites and scaled that up. Me and my friend and his other partner built a portfolio of about 40 different sites. And uh, we're doing about three to 400 articles per month across the board. So a uh, ton, of, ton of fun, lots of, you know, lots of content. Um, yeah, I left that company and I'm working on Trio. Wow. And so that's what, seven years you've been in SEO then. I'm sure when you first dove into SEO, especially in the content game, I'd say a lot has changed over the last seven years. Um, oh, what's, yeah. your opinion, what's your opinion on all of that at the minute? Um, you know, it, it, it makes it a lot harder. You know, I, I, I will admit that, you know, I wish it was like the you know, glory days where you could pretty much do anything and have things rank. But, you know, the double edged sword for that case, you know, people abuse that and, you know, bad, poor quality content starts to outshine people like us who really put in their blood, sweat and tears. And so, you know, I think that overall Google is doing what it does best and trying to crack down on that. But um, that obviously comes with more guidelines, more quality restrictions and just kind of, you know, making sure that you're playing the game right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's nothing like it was back in, you know, 2005 or dot com, but, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely unique nowadays. Awesome. And then in terms of that, obviously, ChatGPT, um, especially in the content game, has changed a lot. Um, a lot of the industry at the minute, there you've got the two sides. So you've got people that are absolutely crapping themselves about it. And then you've got the people that are trucking on, trying to learn as much as they can within it. Um, and use it as an advantage. What's your opinions on all of that? Yeah, no, I think that it's a tool. And I think that, you know, like most tools, it's it's only going to be as good as the person using it. So it's not going to replace. I think that there are going to be certain, you know, divisions of SEO that are definitely going to be more AI heavy. Um, you know, we're, we really do focus on human written content and just kind of making sure that, you know, it's not going to be a direct replacement for your blog content. But you know, we do like to kind of let people know that we are AI focused, meaning that we do try to streamline some processes and systems where we can. And I think that people who are kind of entering that next realm of AI, they're going to be left in the dust if they don't. And so, you know, nowadays it just makes sense to really kind of get that upper hand when it comes to systems and automations, et cetera, with AI. Um, but, you know, overall, it's not going to, you know, completely kill SEO. If anything, I think it should embrace it and just kind of roll with the punches. And Stephen, just obviously on the, the topic of blogs um, and AI, do you think sort of more junior SEOs are going to need to brush up a lot more in sort of AI prompting, moving on to sort of on-page skills rather than a lot more sort of on-page skills? They just know, need to know the basics of the on-page, but more focused on AI prompting. 
Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think it'll be interesting to see how that works. I mean, there's so many good tools out there nowadays that can really kind of just take that process start to finish. So like, you know, we use SEO wind a lot. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but like great product, you know, really one of the most painful things out there, in my opinion, is making content briefs for articles. It's just like a necessary burden, but it also at the same time, is one of those things where if you do it wrong, it really kind of destroys your entire strategy. And so where you can step into a tool that can analyze SERPs and, you know, take a look at word count and all these other things, headings, et cetera, that is just like a night and day difference compared to two years ago where we couldn't do that. But I think that to your question about using prompts and all sort of stuff, it's people are going to be so reliant on it that at some point, I think that they're going to just be like, oh, this is okay because this is as good as the quality gets because they're not either a willing to push it further and try to tinker with it or they're just gonna you know be in that motion of like checking the boxes and trying to move through the act rather than trying to focus on quality and i think that junior seos might accidentally start to get in the habit of quantity versus quality and so you know that's that's fine i'll take it because that just gives us an, an advantage so you know uh yeah. kind of it is what it is mm -hmm. and then um... So just on that topic, then people, so obviously back in 2017, when you started, it was a lot different getting into SEO and building your way up the ranks. What kind of advice would you give to somebody? Let's just say somebody has been in the industry for one to two years now. They're getting very overwhelmed with all AI, everything. And um, the job market's kind of slowing down a bit um, directly because of that. And maybe directly because of the economic downturn run at the minute. What kind of advice would you give to an SEO that's, that's kind of one to two years in that wants to, start climbing the ranks of their salaries and get better at what they're doing. Yeah. I think the biggest thing I was actually just talking to somebody about this yesterday is that the, the biggest thing that I kind of take into consideration when I look at like what worked for me was having so many different sites to just fail. Like, you know, my first site was this starter site that my friend gave me. He's like, here's this site. There's no traffic. You can break it. Like you can't do anything wrong. So I think that, looking at that and just being able to publish content without repercussions is like one of the best things to kind of help accelerate that entire learning process. And so somebody who either wants to learn SEO or is trying to grow their portfolio, like, you know, you can create a, a site in like 30 minutes and just start writing content and just start tinkering with on page aspects, technical aspects, et cetera, and try to really hone in on your skills. And then like the best, you know, part of that entire thing is you pretty much have a free case study when you look back six, 12 months down the road. And so I think that people often try to cling to, oh, I know what SEO is. And so I'm going to just start taking clients on. And then as a result, those flop and that kind of, you know, tarnishes your reputation, your credibility, and it also just wastes a lot of time. And so I think that just having a little side project that you can tinker with and test things on, experiment with, and if that takes off, you know, that's also a potential side business for you. So like the amount of upside there is just unmatched to what could have happened if you didn't have that. 100%. And um, obviously us being in the SEO recruitment game, Stephen, the amount of candidates that we put through and maybe they're, they're eye for eye on experience. They've got the same personality. They've got the same kind of skills, but one of them has got, five affiliates in the side where they've tested everything and they're able to show their findings, what's happened. It's they, they always end up on top um, and get the job offer. Um, so yeah, I fully agree with that. What kind of advice would you give to somebody then starting an affiliate? Because the amount of times we talk about it on phone calls and everyone's like, well, I can't pick a niche. I've been trying for six months to pick a niche. What advice would you give on that? Ooh, that's a hard one. Picking a niche is definitely one of the, the harder things to do in the affiliate space because you know, it's, you're doing, you're pretty much locking yourself into like a six to 12 month time road, you know, a timeline and hoping you're just going down that path correctly. But, you know, I think at some point there also is a little bit of um, an advantage to just giving yourself the okay or like the failure, like the freedom to fail. So, you know, if you start creating content and then you realize that, you know, there's this other niche that you find maybe three, four months in, like, that site that you've worked for on for three or four months isn't a flop. Just let it burn, kind of let it brew, let that content rank and maybe, you know, start passively building some backlinks to it. And if it starts to take off, well then fine. But, you know, switching gears doesn't mean that you're completely letting that other site fall to the wayside. 
But I think that in that same discussion, you have to be able to put a cap on it at some point. Like you don't want to just start hopping around and start making 10 different sites because then, you know, every one of them is going to be neglected except for like two or three. So I think that just be mindful of, you know, where those wins and losses are going to take place. Um, also knowing like when to cut the cord, if a site really just isn't performing, you know, let it go. But I think that mm -hmm. nowadays with the Google product review updates and like the core kind of like uh, updates that came out just to target affiliate sites, like you really have to do your research and you can't just like copy and paste some pros and cons from Amazon reviews and like throw them into an article. I think that if you're going to go down the affiliate route, one of the things that I really look for nowadays is starting an entire site with just informational content first. Like don't do any money making articles, do like 90% informational content, build that authority, build that organic traffic and like build that actual reputation in the niche for being like a dominant brand. And then from there on out, start sprinkling in affiliate content and do maybe like, you know, two per month or one really good article per month. And obviously just like everything in SEO, it's a game of delayed gratification. And so that doesn't mean that you're going to start making money instantly, but it's going to be much more sustainable. You're going to have a much higher upside. And if you choose to flip that site down the road, you have all of that kind of like credibility and authority to kind of get a higher price tag on it. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, and then on that, Stephen, what's your thoughts of hiring somebody that was in the process of being heavily in the process of building affiliates, maybe doing a bit of freelance on the side? What's your kind of thoughts on that? Where do you pull the plug? Yeah, you know, I think it's long. I mean, there's always going to be a trial phase, I think, with working with people, um, you know, when you unless you're hired on like as a salary person with, you know, full time hours and benefits, etc. I think that that's kind of where you need to cut the cord because it does require that level of commitment in order to kind of see everything through to the finish line. And, you know, when it comes to building our team personally, we try to make sure that each new team member is really kind of like another piece of our family and friends. We don't want it to just be a, you know, black and white relationship contracting, et cetera. So we understand that pop-up contracts are going to come and go. So, you know, if we need a one-off service for, you know, graphic design, maybe we need some blog article images designed, like we understand that that's not going to be fully committed to us, but if we're looking for a writer, we just really try to set clear expectations. And then if those expectations are ever kind of blurred along the way, we just try to make sure that, that communication is really strong you know, check in and just remember that at the end of the day, everybody's human. And so things are going to kind of be in flex, you know, here and there. But I think as long as you're not feeling like that relationship from the higher hiree standpoint is being abused, then, you know, you can kind of start to kind of just solidify that relationship and kind of go from there. Awesome. Perfect. And Stephen, you mentioned about sort of family there, making sure they fit into the part of the family. Do you carry out any sort of disk assessments or any sort of personality tasks to ensure that? Or how do you know that somebody you're hiring is going to be a good fit other than obviously yeah. just a, a good CV? Yeah, we don't, we don't do any like personality tests or anything like that. Probably that's probably an interesting thing to just kind of do. I love the Myers-Briggs test. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's a lot to, you know, kind of take away from just like your gut feeling on a person. Like if you have a couple interview calls and, you know, you have a, phone call with them and then you kind of review their work and at the same time you kind of get this like weird feeling that like something's not right or you know you're just not really meshing on you know outside work we also try to talk about um you know when just every people like hey what do you do outside of work and just trying to make sure that they're like morals and values and kind of like everything that makes them them actually kind of fits with our vibe as well and so you know just like you would go to get a drink with someone at a public, like, you know, like whether that person's kind of within your inner group or your friend circle, and if you can kind of see them clicking with you. And so I think that just kind of like listening to that gut feeling and then also just being up front and asking them questions and just trying to like really dive in and remember that they're also interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. Like we would hope that they kind of take a lot of what we're asking them and kind of flip it on us and kind of like to learn about us because at the end of the day, if it's one sided, it's just not going to work out. 100%. And is most of your team, is it, are they remote, Stephen? Yeah, so we have, it's a really small team right now. So we have uh, myself and then my two partners, co-founders. And um, one of them is going to be taking on like the, you know, the chief marketing officer position. And then we have VP of sales. 
and then we have some accounting people and then we have a small team of writers. So really trying to keep it, you know, lean and tight right now and just kind of making sure that a lot of the quality is on the output. And then as we scale, we kind of scale appropriately. And of course, for scaling a remote team, there's a lot of project management systems that need to be in place. What kind of, do you use any project management tools? What kind of tips have you got on that? Yeah, I am a big Airtable guy. I love Airtable. Um, used it, my last company, we used that to kind of push out all that content that I was mentioning. And I pretty much just took that, cooked like that exact replica and then just pasted it into our Trio CMS. So it's pretty much like all of our content management system is just streamlined through your table. So um, really handy, you know, especially as you kind of look into like any kind of tricky scaling systems, it connects with Zapier. Um, also offers, you know, like non-editable views for clients. You can send them off stuff. They can still see the process and kind of be looped in. But um, yeah, I think everyone is keen to Notion nowadays, but I'll stick with Airtable forever, I think. Yeah, we're, we're team ClickUp. I like ClickUp. We use oh, Notion yeah. as well. Nice. I use Notion for like more personal projects, ideas. I use it for like workout um, tables in the gym and stuff. But um, for the business and for everything else, I, I, I like ClickUp. Nice. Yeah, I haven't used that. I've also had a little bit of experience with Monday, but maybe it's just my old ways. Every time I try to like learn something new, I'm like, this is pointless. I'm just going to go back to what I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I uh, one of your uh, partners at Trio SEO, Connor, I see his content all the time on LinkedIn for ages. Um, and then that's when I reached out to him and then he showed me you. And then I've seen your content everywhere now on LinkedIn as well. Um, so obviously personal branding is a really important thing um, to you guys. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I got into LinkedIn around January of this year. I mean, I've had LinkedIn forever. Like all of us, I think I've had it, you know, the dust was pretty heavy once I came back to it in January. <laughs> and uh, just quickly realized like how much opportunity there was. And this was like prior to the the first big algorithm update on LinkedIn where, you know, you could pretty much post like a meme and have it go viral on LinkedIn. Like the organic reach was just insane. Um, and so once I kind of saw that, I like saw the light bulb and that went off. And then, yeah, I found Connor's content. He's kind of like one of the first SEO people I found. And I think we started kind of just networking in like March and yeah, kind of, seeing just the power of personal branding and what it offers is just unreal. I mean, you know, a lot of our leads that come through for Trio are like 99% through LinkedIn. And we have a pretty, pretty thorough uh, due diligence process when looking at taking on clients. We want to make sure that it's a good fit for both parties. And so, you know, we have a pretty, pretty low acceptance rate, to be honest. You know, we probably only accept like 10 to 20% of people who apply just because we want to make sure that we can actually produce those results and it's not like people who are applying with a dr0 site in a finance niche and want to rank for like what is a roth ira like you know just things like that's not going to happen so we don't want to make any false promises but going back to the personal branding thing just the the power of like posting content once per day and seeing what that community offers like the amount of opportunities are pretty much untapped and so i just really see it taking off and you know being that the creator program and LinkedIn has only been live for like two years, I think. And just kind of seeing like what the upside brings with all these other social media platforms. I think that personal branding on LinkedIn is definitely like a right place, right time thing if you're doing it. And yeah, we uh, even, oh, sorry, Josh, go. So we threw our first event there at the start of June and we had a head of digital acquisition from SEMrush come in from Miami. It was all to do with SEO. And I kind of wanted to put, a few talkers in there that were not just about SEO, but they could benefit everybody in the crowd. So we brought in a guy called Shoaib, who he specializes in personal branding. And it was the one where I looked around at everybody in the event and everybody had their phone out taking notes. And it's the one where you've seen so many talented SEOs before not post at all on S on LinkedIn. And since then, they're like followers of shot up. You can see them posting their, their findings, their affiliates, everything. Um, which is great to see because I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. It's same kind of what you mentioned. I'd say 90% of our leads come through LinkedIn. A few from, come from Twitter and the rest come from like referrals. But uh, I'm a big opponent of, I've even told all the team that we should be all building our own personal brand. It's not like 
just talk about the company all the time. Talk about stuff that you enjoy doing and, and, and get that personal brand built. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that. Darius, what were you going to mention there? Um, I was just going to ask you, Stephen, have you noticed anything sort of in terms of the algorithms recently? Because I know maybe two, three months ago, carousels were getting a lot of impressions and stuff on LinkedIn. Recently, definitely my account seems to be taking a big hit in terms of reach with impressions. I don't know. Have you noticed if there's a change or if there's a new sort of meta for posting at the minute? Yeah, I noticed that impressions were down at least this week. Um, and I was talking to Connor about that too. And we kind of just think it's at least a lot of our audience is US based. And so that could have just been with the holiday that we had on Monday um, last week. And so I think that, you know, things are kind of in ebb and flow. And I think that LinkedIn is really trying to prioritize educational content. Um, so yeah, I mean, impressions overall are definitely down compared to where they were months ago. But, you know, it's really random. Like, I, you know, I think that it's, you know, I'll have some posts that just pop off and then it's like, I didn't expect that. And then I'll have like the post that I put a bunch of work into and I'm like, oh, this one's going to crush. It just like flops. And I'm like, okay, cool. Look at that. I just spent all the time on it. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's just random. And I think that as LinkedIn is evolving, it's really kind of trying to hone in on being a social media platform, like keyword there social. And so a lot of that is just tied into like how many people are commenting on your post? How many people are reposting it? Like, are they engaged with your carousels? And like all of those really like SEO metrics that we kind of think about when it comes to blog content or website metrics are now being looped in into carousels and content on LinkedIn. And so I think that keeping that in mind, like impressions might fluctuate, but yeah, to your question, they've definitely been down, which is a bummer, but hopefully they go back up. <laughs> definitely. Um, in terms, how do you sort of measure success then for your sort of personal LinkedIn? Is it sort of leads generated? Is it impressions or does it depend on the post? Yeah. So, I mean, leads are nice, obviously, because they equate to dollars. But at the end of the day, you know, people always say like vanity metrics don't matter and hot take. I disagree. I think that vanity metrics absolutely matter because, you know, look at all the top people. I mean, even Connor, for example, like he's crushing it on LinkedIn and people who have more followers, they just have a bigger community behind them. And so I really kind of use follower count as my own personal success metric, because, you know, if you have... 2000 followers and six months later you have 3000 followers. Well, it's like, okay, obviously something's not clicking because people are not gravitating towards your content and you're not growing. And as a result, like you're pretty much limited by the opportunities that you can push out to that community. And so I think that if you look at content and then look at, you know, this post generated X amount of new followers compared to this other post, well, then that's kind of like my key metric I use is because like that is what really kind of says like, hey, this is working and people want to gravitate towards you and they're like more inclined to engage with you. And it's just kind of like a rinse and repeat cycle from there. Awesome. What kind of advice would you give to somebody that's wanting to build up their personal brand on LinkedIn? I just say post a lot. Like it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where like you really can't get around the fact that, you know, it's just content's king and, um, community is queen in that sense. And so like, you know, I always say, if you want to get into it, like start posting and don't jump straight to carousels, like just post posts and get really good at the little things like hooks and formattings and like all of the basics that come with how to post content on LinkedIn. And then aside from that, I would say, you know, look at community aspects. So like, who are you engaging with? How do your DMs look? Are you doing connection requests? Are you replying to people? Like, all of this thing, it feels like a full-time job. Um, mm -hmm. But I would also think that if people are trying to get into personal branding, they should really dive into the personal branding niche. And that's what I did. Like the first six to seven months of my entire LinkedIn journey, I didn't post about SEO at all. Like I had this entire experience about SEO. And then I was like, I'm going to go post about personal branding. And I was like, that's the biggest mistake looking back on it. I wish I would have <laughs> stuck with SEO forever. But I think that it was also quite essential to learn about personal branding and kind of do a deep dive into that space. And so I think like anything, it has to, you have to be fully immersed in that community for a little bit, just to kind of learn what works and what doesn't, and then roll the punches and start testing. Mm, absolutely. And um, that's one thing as well for our candidates that kind of come to us. Um, with, I, I, I don't know if I've coined the phrase, but I've been saying it probably 20 times a day that I think the CV is dead. 
Um, I think LinkedIn is a, is a digital CV that a lot of our clients, it's one of the first things they ask for is could we have a link to their LinkedIn, check if they're active on LinkedIn, are they chatting with industry experts, are they putting up their own findings? Um, and just building on that, it's just something that I think a lot more people should do. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Darius, have you got any more questions on personal branding on LinkedIn? And I was just going to say, um, how how do people come up with the right hooks? I know a lot of people are struggling, like especially we try and post every day. I know you said post as much as possible, but um, I'm not sure if if you know, do, do you get penalized for posting twice a day? Because we definitely think it limits your, your initial post if you post again. Um, but yeah, how important is it to get the hook right on a post? Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the most important parts. Um, I don't think that there's ever a penalty, but I definitely would say that my gut says that your second post will definitely get fewer impressions or less reach just because I think that LinkedIn will prioritize your first piece of content to show it to people. And then it's trying to see like, does is the second one almost worthy to show again? But I think that, you know, look at people like Gary V or, you know, these Titans that post just nonstop, like their accounts are growing like crazy. And it's because it's a numbers game. And so if you have the capacity to post twice a day or three times a day, like I would say absolutely do it as long as the quality is still there. Um, but going to your question about hooks, it's funny enough you ask because I, a lot of my entire like first couple of months on LinkedIn was just spent collecting hooks. And so that was like when I was back in personal branding, that was the digital product that I released like three or four months in was called Stop the Scroll. And it has like 400 different hook templates that I made. And it was just because I started creating these and I was like, I need hooks. Hooks are so important. Here's all the hooks I made for the community. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where if you have the ability to just like really study hooks and there's great people out there that are, you know, like Ryan Musselman is like one of the founding fathers of writing a good hook, I think. And so if you can study the best and then kind of just start to take bits and pieces from that and just start experimenting and see what works and what doesn't work. And then if one really pops off, like take note of that, write it down and try to mix it into like future posts and see if that works. And uh, last question then on, on personal branding. Um, do you plan your content weeks before on the weekend or do you do everything just before on the day? Yeah. So I have my content planned out like about two months in advance. Um, that doesn't mean that they're all scheduled two months in advance, but um, <laughs> yeah, like I have that many topics kind of in my like tool belt and I have them like partially written. Um, there was a period of time where I would have like all my carousels, you know, prepped and ready, but I'm on this like, OCD carousel sprint right now where like I accidentally, like accidentally got into a motion of posting a carousel every single day. And I think it's like almost two months now. And so I like can't break that streak. I feel like I like, I just, I can't do it for whatever reason. And so now I'm like on this hamster wheel to like constantly create carousels, which is great. But at the same time, it's like, you know, definitely hard. So um, yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword, but I always say if you have the ability to like batch create content and schedule it out, like, do it it's the most like luxury you can ever afford <laughs> awesome um well look steven the next thing i wanted to chat about is we're creating a playbook it's called uh leadership and seo um just because basically we were coming across so many seos that either didn't have the right transition from junior to mid to senior or they're in senior position and they're just not very good at leading um, we hear time and time again, uh, one of my favorite quotes is that people don't leave jobs, they leave poor management. Um, so basically because of that, we've, we've created this. I think we've got 87 modules in it at the minute. We've been putting months of work into it. But um, in terms of leadership, especially in SEO, what would you say is the best traits of a leader? Mm, I would say patience. I think that patience across the board in SEO is kind of one of those skills where you need patience to see results come to life, but you also need patience in your team to understand that, you know, if you're working with people who are in that entry level position, that they're leaning on you as much as you're leaning on them. So it is definitely kind of like the symbiotic relationship to see things come to life. And so, you know, if, if they're entering that relationship as like a mentor mentee thing, then you know, you owe it to them to explain why you're doing things and like go the extra mile to 
create like, you know, loom overview videos and like maybe written SOPs, like really kind of communicate that with them on how they learn best. And then kind of keep that in mind as you're trying to, you know, bring them up. Because I think that as you support people over time and you kind of put in that extra effort early on, like that's going to pay dividends down the road. And so I think just being mindful that like not every single person is, has 10 years of experience, you know, some people are just trying to get their foot in the door. And so if they can, you know, learn with you and learn under you and kind of be your like right hand person and kind of be like a mini me over time, like that's so valuable in your company because then and over time you can just say like, Hey, I need help with keyword research. And you can trust that that process is going to be done correctly or, you know, X, Y, Z fill in the blank and kind of just start offloading tasks. And then over time, that entry level person now evolves into a manager and now they're leading a team. And so, you know, as you focus patience, that creates leverage. And as you incorporate more leverage, you incorporate scale. And so it's like this kind of crazy catalyst system where you just start to kind of like see this the whole entire thing come to life, all because you were just calm and patient and understanding. So that's what I would say. Awesome. I love that one. I love that. That was, very, that was a really good answer. I really like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, Darius, have you got any more questions on any, any leadership? Um, in terms of sort of advice for a younger person who's maybe two, three years within the industry and they want to make that step up to management, is there anything that you've maybe witnessed before that they might have missed out or any experience that they, is crucial to make that jump? Yeah, I would say like one of the things is definitely confidence. I think that if you're going to step into a managerial role, you have to not only be confident in what you're doing and what you're kind of like asking your team to do, but also just confidence in yourself that you, you know, have the capacity to deliver good instructions or to follow up on goals and deadlines and like, you know, create that accountability system. And so if you're somebody who struggles with accountability or, you know, following up on deadlines and just the general things that managers have to do, like they're non-negotiables, then maybe you should rethink that or create a system to kind of like, you know, really ensure that that's not going to be an issue because, you know, once you're leading a team and people will count on you and then, you know, even your superiors and leadership above the manager role, like directors or execs are depending on you, like, it's it's you're kind of in that you know, crunch zone you can't really afford to fumble the ball so i would say play it slow play it smart and really think through the entire process awesome. um and then in terms of um obviously running a, a remote team um i would say like our, our team's fully remote as well like we, we make an effort to try and meet up with everybody um quite a bit but being a leader virtually is a lot different than being on the ground, showing people strategies, showing different things. Um, what's your opinions on that? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's definitely a unique situation. Um, you know, definitely considering just how broad the entire landscape is of where you hire people nowadays, it's not like you're hopping on a call in the same time zone. You know, you have to be able to be flexible in the fact that maybe you're staying up late one week and maybe they're staying up late the other week, you know, kind of making sure that you're, balancing everything and then also when it comes down to it making sure that meetings and calls aren't just strictly business like take that time to ask them about their family ask them about their weekend like make it more personable i think that that really goes a long way in just developing that relationship and kind of strengthening the team overall so you know just like all the things that we would do in person you know aside from going out and grabbing lunch or whatever it is try to incorporate that into your team and your meetings or you know if you're using slack you know DM them, ask them about their day, or you know, send them a funny thing that reminded them of like, there's so many little things that we kind of overlook just being virtual, but they're so easy to do like birthdays, for example, like send them a gift, not that hard. So like things like that, where you can just, it's so easy to do. And that person is like, it makes their day. So I would say don't kind of write off that you can't do something just because they're across the world. Like there's usually a will and a way to make it happen. Yeah, I find that um, funny that you mentioned about just messaging them on Slack, seeing uh, how their day is. We have uh, our head of marketing is based down in Cape Town in South Africa. And I'd say we get, what, 10 photos of cats a day, Doris? <laughs> at least, pictures, at least. Cats, funny videos, everything is funny. That's perfect. But, uh, I mean, like, because, like, when you meet up in person, like, you, you now have that, like, extra bond because you can talk about, like, 
ah, uh, you can't see me a cat video because I'm here today. You know, like something like that, where it's just like it, it enhances that entire that relationship overall. Yeah, well, we actually flew her up to our event in the UK there um, in June. And it was lovely. She came with her husband as well. So it was lovely to get to meet face to face. And then I think I'm going to bring the team down to Cape Town in January because it's their summer as well. And it won't be nice weather in the UK or Ireland. So it's a win-win. But um, yeah. But yeah. yes. Um, Stephen, on that as well, you talked obviously a lot of good points there for retention and how to retain sort of top talent. But how would you go about, obviously, at the current market, every, a lot of sort of fully remote options? How do you do you have any strategies to actually attract the top leaders in the industry? Yeah, so I would say, you know, definitely go through a process of like hiring really slow and firing fast. I think that that's something I've always stuck with, um, trying to ensure that they're a good fit, like all the things I've just talked about. But, you know, when it comes to actually performing and executing on the task, you know, don't be afraid to send them tasks and tests or, you know, hey, like basics for Excel, like I need you to perform this. And like in the past of when hiring people, you know, if it comes to like keyword research sheets, like I need you to have like basic functions on V lookups and average formulas, like all the things that we use every day. But at the same time, I can't afford for you to just like go and use and hire that out and then come back to me and say it's done. So like if I need to hop on a call and I'll, hey, share your screen and walk through this process with me. And if they fumble under pressure and they're not confident, like that's probably a red flag. And so mm -hmm. on the other side of it, if they can just knock it out and you can talk to them like this and they're doing it and you're laughing and cracking jokes along the way, like that's going to be a solid team member you can kind of stick with for the long run. And so I think that, you know, incorporating small sample tests along the way. And then the other side of it is like when trying to like create good JDs and trying to create like things that will actually attract talent. I'd say make sure that it's really clear on like the benefits and the values of the company and like what do they kind of step into and how can they envision themselves in this for the long run and making sure that they're a good fit for you, but they're also like on the same side, are they getting it the same kind of level of, you know, affirmation and kind of rewarding values out of the company and the team and all that sort of stuff. Um, Cause I mean, at the end of the day, like, like I said early on, we wanted to make sure that they're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing them. Like it's a 50, 50 kind of relationship from the get go. So um, yeah, I think just like clear communication up front and just kind of listing like, Hey, this is what we do. This is what we prioritize. And if this is a good fit for you, we'd love to kind of, you know, take, take it to the next level. Awesome. And um, what kind of stuff do you do, Stephen, to increase your productivity, time, key project management? Have you got any little tips on that? Yeah, so I like religiously use my Google Calendar like by the hour or like the half hour. So um, if I'm not in meetings, I'll usually do like time blocking. So, you know, if it's like I have 30 minutes, I'm going to knock out this task. And then if I'm like in a flow, like at that 30 minute mark, like that sucks. I just got to cut it off and go to the next thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I really try to time block and kind of make sure that like my day is like if I'm going to set out to accomplish this, then I by the end of the day, like that thing is done because at the end of the week, like I kind of have this mental to-do list that I need to ensure that like all my ducks are in a row. Um, aside from that, like I try to make sure that my phone, like notifications are silenced, like all the easy wins. Um, and just kind of like making sure that Slack is minimized to some degree. Um, another kind of like a little hack I've been doing recently is I'll be using, um, at least on Google Chrome, I'll like pin the tab, which kind of like minimizes the like width of the tab itself, which also kind of like is nice because it hides notifications better. So like if I have LinkedIn open and I pin that tab, I don't see like the little one or like the little someone message you thing. I can just kind of like keep it out of sight, out of mind. Um, so yeah, anything to like eliminate distractions overall, like you know, turning off notifications, not just the DND, &D, but like yeah. badge notifications on stuff like that. Like, I don't want to see that I have like a little one, like a little web, like just <laughs> stop and no, I can't do it. So um yeah that's pretty much it but nothing crazy the the time blocking of your calendar how long did it take you to to get good at it because it's something i've tried maybe 10 times and i just <laughs> can't stick at it um you know funny enough i did it in college and i kind of experimented like back in the day when i was like i will do anything to be more productive and then i kind of let that fall off because i didn't need it and now that i'm like ultra busy again um you know, it really has just kind of been one of those things where you have to experiment with it. And 
you know, maybe I'm not as diligent as I just said, like, you know, if there's five minutes overlap, whatever, like I'm human, but at the same time, I think just knowing the upside and what it can deliver in terms of productivity, like that's enough of like kind of win for me to double down on it and try to like make it a priority. Um, but I also really just like the satisfaction of seeing like a full calendar at the end of the week, like all those blocks are kind of full. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like a way to gamify my productivity is to kind of like turn it into like some sort of like Tetris screen where I can like make sure all of my tasks and then I can look back and see. Um, I'm also a big data nerd. So I can look back and if I color code certain tasks, like all of my meetings are color coded, all my podcasts are color coded, all of my like keyword research is color coded. Then I can look back and see like, here's how my time is being allocated week by week or month by month, et cetera. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have any sort of AI tools that you're using at the minute that just, even if it's like something like a really small task that's just getting done maybe 10 times quicker? Yeah, SEO wind, like I think I talked about that earlier, but like it's mm -hmm. the craziest tool I've ever used. Um, Tom is a great guy too. So if you haven't met him, definitely recommend talking to him. But um, yeah, just the ability to like make really optimized writer briefs and SEO is like something that used to take us hours, hours. Mm -hmm. And now I can bust out like 10 and like 30 minutes. It's just insane. So um yeah, that ChatGPT, obviously I use Bard when ChatGPT can't perform. Um, but like, yeah, I'm not like a super AI focused person. I know like everyone has a tool for everything nowadays, but um, I try to keep it pretty simple. <laughs> cool. And uh, Steven, you sound like you're a really, really busy guy. What kind of things do you do to, to switch off outside of work? Um, not enough to be honest. <laughs> like, I don't know. I really just like working. It's kind of one of my biggest downfalls. My wife always jokes that like, I don't have that off switch. Um, <laughs> but if I do, it's usually like, I like to golf, um, a lot where at least weather permitting. Um, I like to watch like trash TV. It's kind of like my guilty pleasure is like binging, like really bad TV reality shows. <laughs> um, or just kind of like doing nothing and like mindlessly scrolling like YouTube. I mean, trying to like take away screen time is hard just because it's so intertwined into my life. But um, yeah, like I'll play like business video games. Like I like, like tycoon esque things where I can kind of still like scratch that itch in the business world, but kind of switch gears. Um, you know, I play Xbox, PlayStation, kind of all the normal things too. So um, I try, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I've got one more question before we end. Darius, have you got, any other questions for Stephen? Just more of a sort of a general one, probably uh, should have said at the start, but in terms, do you, what are your consumers sort of biggest hesitancies, hesitancies when it comes to sort of persuading them to spend big? Because obviously SEO is a long-term strategy. How do you get them to maybe value the sort of the larger picture? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that when it comes down to it, um, we just try to show them results in case studies. like case studies are like one of the best things you can do for your business. If you're growing, if you're new, like even if you're well-established, like you have all that data, just because it shows like, Hey, if you're going to invest this money and invest this time, like we understand that it's business focused for you and you want to see the ROI and, you know, believe us, we don't want to waste our time and we want to make sure that it's a good fit for the long term. And so, um, showing those results and then, you know, doing our best to put together a strategy that can execute similar results for them. Um, but also I think that being honest and transparent with people and kind of understanding that it's maybe not every client is going to be a good fit because, you know, it kind of goes back to like, I've seen so many memes on LinkedIn where it's like the $500 client will send you like a thousand emails, but then like the $5,000 per month client will just wire you the money and like, let you do your thing. And I think that to some degree there are people like that. And so like if people are hesitant about it and, you know, they look at it as like, that's a lot of money to them, you know, regardless of not even our services, but other people's services, that might not be a good fit because, you know, there's a lot more on the table and trust. And so you have to kind of like, you know, ensure that they're comfortable with what you're doing. And like, we need somebody who can just trust us and do our work and it's going to be hands off. And we know that we'll get results for you and you can just trust us to do our thing. And so, um, I think that that really is what it comes down to is just like really solid communication, making sure that the deliverables are clear, making sure that the KPIs are really clear and that we're not going into a relationship where they feel like they're always 
know, anxious about it. We want to make sure that they're really solid and just really comfortable from start to finish. And, and how often do you sort of liaise with your clients and is it on a monthly basis or? Um, what was that? Sorry again. How often do you sort of liaise with your clients then? Is it only oh, sort yeah. of like a, for your customers? Is it like a monthly basis or? Yeah, we try to do monthly check-ins. Um, if we can minimize communication, we prefer quarterly just because SEO takes so long. And so it's like, obviously we like to check in on little things like, hey, these are the topics we're doing. But um, for when it comes to like actionable results and data, you know, it's better to kind of look at that on a bigger kind of grand scheme. And so, um, yeah, we'll kind of do like periodic things like just to ensure that they know that we're not ghosting them. And likewise, we want to make sure that they're comfortable with the process. But um, yeah, less is more, I think, in SEO. And so kind of we can look back in three months or six months and say like, hey, look at like all this traffic or all these signups or registrations or whatever their KPIs are, and then kind of go from there and kind of modify communication from there on out. Brilliant. Awesome. And just my last question for you, Stephen, is where do you think the future of SEO is going? Oh, geez, the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that it's definitely going to get harder, but there's no doubt about that. Um, but I also don't think it's like SEO is dead. I know everyone loves to say that. Um, I, I think that it's just going to, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how AI takes over, like with search results and stuff like that. But I think at the end of the day, everyone has to remember that Google makes money based on ads. And so if people are not like on the SEM train and like paying for Google ads, like they make money through AdSense. And so they're never going to try to kind of cut people off from viewing articles or viewing content and clicking ads and like making money because if not, they would die. And so I just think that over time, it's going to really take a shift toward quality and making sure that, you know, black hat is dying down and gray hat is shifting more toward black instead of gray and white. And so I think that it just really comes down to playing by the book and trying to build relationships. And I think that networking is going to be a really like massive part in how link buildings formed or how podcasts are, you know, developed and just the little things that weren't an issue or not an issue, but weren't in the discussion five years ago are now just going to be, ultra prioritized from marketing managers and sales teams, like even personal branding, you know, that entire realm that we never thought was going to be included in SEO is now going to be a small part of off page and on page and all these things that are now like starting to pop up. So it's kind of a long winded answer to say, like, I think it'll be fun to see how it evolves, but I just think that people are going to have to be okay with experimenting with new things. And if they're going to be scared, then they'll be left behind because everything's changing nowadays and it's happening quickly. So it'll be fun to see how it unfolds. Awesome. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. Stephen, if anybody listens to this and want to find you, where can they get you? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me just by searching my name, Steven Schneider, or at Schneis, that's S-C-H-N-E-I-S. Uh, you can also find me at trioseo.com. And uh, yeah, looking forward to meeting you guys if you reach out. Awesome. I'm going to put all the, all the links below um, so they can find you as well. Thank you so much, Steven. Great. Thanks, guys. Cheers.